Welcome to part two of my interview with Dr. Michael Clapper. If you have not seen the first part of the interview, definitely go check that out first. There's so much cool information in that. But in this one, we talk about vitamin K2, bone density, high fat vegan diets, low fat vegan diets, the ketogenic diet, we talk about omega-3s, high protein bean pasta, fasting, and a whole bunch more. As I mentioned in part one, the audio is not the best. I did what I could with the equipment I had there and in post-production here at home, but it's the information that is important, so please just overlook any sort of ambient noises uh, and just listen to the amazing information that he so kindly is providing with us. So you mentioned protein. Uh, is the, you know, the protein quality and the amino acids that we get from plant foods superior or inferior to that of animal meat and animal products? Of course it's sufficient and at the risk of being repetitive here, uh, ask any racehorse, ask any buffalo um, if the amino acids they're eating uh, in the natural grains and grasses they're consuming um, are sufficient to make strong animal muscle. Of course it is. Yeah. Ask any gorilla, of, of course. Uh, the amino acids don't know where they are and there's all a complete assortment of them in all plant foods. So absolutely, eat enough calories, you're going to get enough amino acids. And again, uh, I've never written a diagnosis of amino acid deficiency from inability to absorb from plant. That, right. No, it doesn't happen. So not to worry, uh, all the gorillas agree. <laughs> Um, perfect. So I often post what I eat in a day videos and uh, I, I, you know, I love doing them and a lot of the time what I'll do is I'll plug all the information into a chronometer and uh, you know, we go over at the end the sort of, you know, if I've hit all my RDIs and no surprise, most of the time I hit 100% of my RDIs, uh, but I'm always met with the argument or the comment, yeah, but what about absorption? You're not absorbing all of that. Right. So what do you have to say to that? And again, a couple things about these recommended daily intakes, the RDIs. One, um, they are purposely engineered. The number they come up with uh, is enough to assure nutritional superabundance in, in basically every human being walking the earth. Uh, so they've built in this uh, a large margin uh, just uh, for to make sure there's nutritional adequacy. Right. But also, they know very well that not every atom of selenium gets absorbed, and so they also factor in uh, into that number the amount of nutrients that naturally is not going to get absorbed. So that's yeah. already in the uh, in the RDI there. So again, it's, it's nothing to uh, to stress about. Right. And again, these are statistical averages. Just because you only got ninety five percent. Uh, of cobalt, believe me, you're, you're exceeded what your body really needs. Yeah, that, that surplus has been built into the numbers. Perfect. Uh, so, vitamin K2. This is, uh, you know, a bit of, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's a hot topic, but it's definitely sort of come into light recently. And uh, it's one of the arguments against veganism that, you know, of course we could eat natto uh, for K2, but other than that, there are not many sources of, of K2 in the, uh, in the vegan diet. Uh, so K1 versus K2. Is K2 something that we have to be seeking out actively? Do we have to be wolfing down from natto in order to be healthy and have yeah. strong bones or, or is vitamin K sufficient? Yeah, absolutely not. And uh, we can talk about the physiology behind osteoporosis and building strong bones, but the amount of osteoporosis we're seeing now is skyrocketing due to our sedentary lifestyle, not to vitamin K deficiency. Throughout history, as people are working every day, their bones stayed strong throughout their entire lifetime. And vitamin K deficiency wasn't an issue as long as they're eating enough dark green vegetables. Um, to make a long story short, when you eat uh, dark green leafy vegetables, you're going to be getting the precursors of vitamin K, a uh, very important vitamin for blood coagulation, etc. But once you're eating this kind of diet and you spawn microbes that are, are uh, used to digesting plant foods, uh, you, you call forth a strain of microbes that will take the vitamin K1 molecule and turn it into vitamin K2 for you. So all the vitamin K2 that you're going to need is really uh, produced by the microbes in your gut, assuming you're eating a regular helping of dark green vegetables and pretty much on a daily basis, which all vegans and everybody, whether vegan or not, should do. There should be something dark and green on your plate in, in substantial amount. Kale, chard, broccoli, bus sprout, bok choy, etc. Dr. Essenston runs the list there. But <laughs> you, you want a, a good helping of that. Yeah. And if you do that on a daily basis, the microbes you're going to spawn will create the vitamin K2 for you. Amazing. So yeah, you mentioned um, osteoporosis and, you know, 
I talked to a lot of people that have been drinking milk all their life, right? And they come into adulthood and they find that they have osteoporosis. They have low bone density. Uh, and we had a couple of questions on our Facebook group where people asked, is this reversible? Can you, uh, can you gain bone density back? Absolutely. Thank you. Such an important question. And I'll go into the answer, but I'll remind your viewers. If you go to my website, drclapper.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com, and click on webinars, you'll see a webinar there called Healthy Bones and mm -hmm. called How to Reverse Osteoporosis. And I deal with all this in detail in my video, Healthy Bones, on my website. That said, uh, what you just said is such a beautiful example of how the dairy industry has mm -hmm. been masterful in convincing humans uh, in the West that somehow drinking the milk of a cow equals strong bones. And it obviously is not true for many reasons, but the proof of it is in your statement. I, right. I were drinking milk all my life, and I still got osteoporosis. <laughs> yeah. That's because drinking milk will not prevent osteoporosis. Uh, yeah. Osteoporosis is not a disease of calcium deficiency. It's not a disease of cow's milk deficiency. Uh, we've become sedentary. We used to spend our days active, out gathering firewood, lifting bales of hay, working yeah. in the garden, heavy tools. And every time you do something physically, and you, as you know well, mm -hmm. you stress the bones, and the micro-stresses of the bones are what makes the bone-producing cells, the osteoblasts, spin out new bone. It's just like your muscles. You use them, and then the muscle cells get bigger. Yep. You stop using them, and they atrophy. Well, that's what's happening in the bones. Osteoporosis is not a calcium deficiency. Osteoporosis is disuse atrophy of the bones. We're sitting all day. We sit and we eat. We sit and we travel. We sit and we work. We sit and we watch TV. We sit and we watch the, the email. We sit and we do interviews. <laughs> uh, we, sit, say. we sit, we sit, we <laughs> sit. And that's why our bones are dissolving. Yeah. Now, the good news is that those bone-producing cells, the osteoblasts, are still in your bones even if you have osteoporosis. So the answer to reversing it is start using your bones. Start uh, get a little five-pound weighted vest, seven-pound weighted vest, and grab a couple of three-pound hand weights. Go for a walk every day, and that that steady repetitive strain as as you walk will start strengthening your bones up. Get elastic bands, uh, carry packages, use your bones, and they will get stronger. And bone density goes up. Osteoporosis reverses. But the answer is using your bones, and not drinking cow's milk. So. Not a surprise in what you said, but lots of hope for people with low bone density. Amazing. Um, so there's a lot of talk about um, omegas right now in, in the sort of plant-based movement, and uh, it's sort of come to light that we might have to incorporate an algae-based DHA uh, EPA supplement. Um, what is your thought on that? Can we get enough, uh, you know, uh, can we get enough ALA from flax, chia, hemp, you know, all the omega-3 right. sources? for our body to manufacture enough EPA and DHA, or should we be uh, thinking about supplementing this? Right. That's an important question, and I'll try not to get too wonky in the biochemistry here. We're talking about these long-chain fatty acids, uh, and the one that has the first double bonded carbon atom number three is an omega-3 fatty mm -hmm. acid. And your body uses these for your brain health, for your muscles, for your nerves. Uh, and it's important to take in enough, and everybody should have a handful of walnuts every day, uh, a tablespoon or two of ground flax on your oatmeal, uh, chia seeds, these are wonderful, and these dark green leafy veggies have omega-3s in them. So absolutely, uh, people should keep a steady supply of these omega-3s uh, going through their body. The question is, is it enough? Um, mm -hmm. And the enough is not to prevent heart disease. Um, we're talking about your brain. Uh, the brain has a lot of DHA in it, this long chain omega-3 fat. And there's been some studies that long-term vegans, as the years go by, if, if they're not consuming enough DHA, they may wind up with either atrophy of the brain or downright dementia. And there's been some disturbing reports, and I've had a couple of patients uh, with dementia on uh, long-term vegan diets. It's got me concerned enough Again, we're not living like our ancient ancestors who might have been living along the seashores and eating seaweed every day and, mm -hmm. and uh, eating huge amounts of greens as they forage. We're not living that kind of life. And that's why our DHA level might drop down. And uh, so because dementia is so serious, um, I take a, um, a, a veggie cap of omega-3 of, of DHA made from algae, not from fish, from algae. Uh, most days of the week, five, seven days a week, I'll, I'll pop in one of these omega-3s or take a square of the liquid. So I think it's a good idea to prevent dementia. Would I develop it anyway? Probably, hopefully, probably not, but I just don't want to take the chance. It's kind of an insurance policy, mm -hmm. so that's where I am on that. 
Perfect. Yeah, dementia is clearly not a vegan specific uh, no, condition. Most right? people get dementia are not vegan. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, no. Um, and and I, I don't know if you know this, but will this uh, affect our, our own manufacturing of EPA and DHA from ALA? If we I don't believe so. Okay. No, there's no real evidence of that. Your enzymes should still be able to handle it. Well, this is a small amount. This is a tiny amount. Right. Just kind of a baseline insurance form. I don't think it's enough to inhibit your own production. So, uh, there's a lot of different camps of uh, sort of the vegan diet, right? You know, there's people that uh, want to eat a completely raw diet. They want to, you know, people are trying a high fat. Some even trying a ketogenic. Uh, some do such, you know, just a fruitarian or super low fat diet. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily want you to touch on any of these in particular unless you want to, but are there any benefits, you know, for us to be trying out these sort of fringes of, of the plant-based eating, or do you think, like, you know, should we be eating sort of the more balanced, I guess? Is, is Right. In general, if you're basically a healthy person, you should be eating a normal, balanced, whole food, plant-based diet, and that would be something like uh, oatmeal and porridge and, and fruit in the morning with a little almond milk on it, say, and lunches and dinners, big glorious salads, hearty vegetable soups, big plates of steamed green, mm -hmm. yellow veggies, lots of whole grain, quinoa, etc., casseroles, chilies. Okay, um, I'm getting hungry. Yeah, you know, the same here. <laughs> uh, and uh, lots of fruit for dessert. If you're eating that kind of diet, for most people, that's all you need to do. There is no advantage to, to keeping the fat so low that you're afraid, oh, there's a sunflower seed there, get it off. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it takes the joy out of eating. Eating should be a, it should be a nourishing, um, activity on every level. It should not be an anxiety producing event. If you are anxious about your nutrients, there, there's something not right in your approach to your overall diet. Yeah. Now, that said, uh, as, I, as I prefaced it, if you're a normal, healthy person without any serious disease. Now, if you are one of Dr. Esselstyn's patients whose arteries are so clogged up yeah. with atherosclerotic plaque and you get angina walking half a block and you have to take a nitrogen. If you're in that state, yeah. you probably shouldn't be eating lots of avocados right. and, and nuts, etc. I, I grant that. And so that's why he's very low fat. But once those plaques dissolve away, I don't think uh, fat intake is, needs to be curtailed as severely. I don't think there's any advantage. Uh, that I'm pretty dead set against the ketogenic diet. So ketosis is a helpful state to be in for a few days, a week, a short term. Mm -hmm. But to stay in ketosis week after week, month after month, and think that that's healthy and normal, uh, I think it's a, it's a grave error. I think that's going to lead to lots of health problems that we can talk about if you want to. But, um, but uh, there's no advantage to a vegan keto diet. Um, the vast majority of people who are basically healthy should eat the whole food plant-based diet that I mentioned, and your body will know what to do with it. The, the, this is all fad folks uh, writing books, mm -hmm. selling supplements, scaring people. But eat food. Mm -hmm. Eat whole plant food in, cool. in, in, uh, in enough quantities, prepare it properly, chew it well, and your body will be fine. Uh, you mentioned atherosclerotic plaque, and I just have to say, like, I was, I was listening to a talk of yours on the way here, and um, I, you know, I've seen the pictures of the, you know, artery sort of a window cut in or cut open or whatever, uh, and them pulling it out or, or showing it. And, you know, I thought that would be a really, really isolated case. Um, but the way that you that you mentioned it, it was sort of like you just saw this be, you know, you saw it happening all the time and, and actually like physically pulling out a chunk of of plaque out of someone's arteries. This is actually happening. That's the disease, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it kills every other person on this continent. Wow. Absolutely. I, and it's from what we're eating. Yeah. The pipes are getting clogged up from, from too much uh, wow. accidentally. You, yeah, you mentioned that you had sort of a, a, a light bulb moment where you thought, hey, this looks a lot like chicken fat. <laughs> and, and a little voice up my shoulder. Yeah. Said, it's a good reason why it looks like chicken fat, doctor. Yeah. My <laughs> it is chicken fat, yeah, exactly. Cow fat, and pig fat, and all the other fat these people are eating. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you mentioned uh, it might be beneficial to be in a ketogenic state for a short period of time, mm -hmm. and yes. I'm guessing you're referencing sort of fasting yes. uh, and water fasting. I know this mm -hmm. is a, a good part of your practice mm -hmm. when you're helping people, um, and we know you know that it should uh, extended water fast should always be done with professional help. Extended more than five days. More than five days if you're helping. Mm -hmm. um, is there any sort, you know, should should the average person like me or, you know, or Crystal or whatever uh, be practicing any type of fasting, you know, for our health uh, outside of that? Any sort of intermittent fasting or just, you know, not eating for extended periods of time, lower calorie days? What are your thoughts on that? 
Yes, I believe there's good benefit in uh, refraining from food, uh, staying in the constantly fed state. And that's, that's a thing, the constantly fed state. Um, it means you're running around, walking around high insulin levels, uh, which can spawn inf inflammation. You have um, a particular type of uh, gut flora, different fats in your blood. It's a good idea yeah, to kind of reproduce what our ancient foraging ancestors a million years ago on the African savanna. You know, there, you could can, can see that you know there might be frequent times when four or five days would go by before you found that next berry bush with fruit on it. Mm -hmm. And these intermittent fasts were probably a beneficial uh, state to be in. And during that time, the body takes advantage of it. It, it looks for calories to burn it by cleaning out cellular debris uh, and throwing it into the metabolic furnace. It's a phenomenon that's called the autophagy. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, inflammation subsides. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a beneficial state to be in every so often. Yep. Like, say, once a month, uh, people do three days, four or five days on water. I think it's a lovely thing to do. Or just as you mentioned, delay your breakfast. Uh, take that nighttime fasting period that you've been in and extend it all through the morning mm -hmm. hours to a good 18 hours of uh, water only. And uh, and that is, uh, exerts beneficial effects on the body as well. Right. We're just learning about these. But mm -hmm. uh, we eat too much too often. So we, um, eating has become a recreational activity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we should honor it by eating when we're hungry and, and enjoying those times when we're not eating. Uh, good repair and regeneration is happening in our body in those times. Really cool. Uh, so there are some, I know you're not a fan of refined flowers <laughs> and, and no, refined sure. foods, fair yeah. enough, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I agree, uh, not that I completely avoid them entirely, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm only human. Uh, but there are some, some new foods on the market that I'm interested to hear your opinion on, uh, and it's these uh, sort of like lentil and bean pastas that are out there, because mm -hmm. I know that uh, you know refined wheat pastas and rice pastas and stuff, they, they don't have a great effect on our, on our you know, uh, blood sugar levels. Right. Uh, you know, are there? Do you think that these are any better? These bean and lentil pastas. The Marginally, sure. Yeah, I think they're a lovely product, and I think they're better than the old white flour uh, pasta you get at the Italian restaurant. Um, you know, you, you don't eat them three times a day, mm -hmm. uh, but by and large, if you're going to be making a pasta dish, well, I think these are lovely. They, as you mentioned, very low glycemic index. Uh, they carry a good protein wallet, and uh, I think they're they're very beneficial. So I'm, I'm a fan of those. I Sweet. They're good. Yes. Nice. Yeah. We like we like them. There's all sorts of like it's really neat with all the stuff that's it's coming wonderful. out. It's wonderful. It's great. I mean, it, it's good and bad, there. right? Because yes, you know, we're talking about processed food. There's processed yeah. foods, and then there's minimally, yes. you know, just touched up. Uh, for <laughs> touched and, uh, up. I and like and that. This is this is in that category. Just to, to make lentils into a pasta. I think you're not. I'm gonna really I'm gonna quote you on that when, when people ask. <laughs> I'm gonna say no. I don't eat processed foods. I just eat them slightly touched up. Uh, a little it, bit. It, it, really, I think making pasta out of lentils is minimal processing. Yeah. I think it's fine. Cool. Um, so. I often turn to people like yourself, like Dr. Greger, like Dr. Neil Barnard, Dean Ornish, uh, for advice, for guidance, and for motivation. Uh, and I can't imagine where you know people such as yourself turn uh, to oh. to uh, you know for motivation, for guidance, for for any inspiration. Sure. I turn to the natural world. I turn to my own body and the human body that I've been studying all these decades. And what is the truth of this? Well, I, I look at the athletes. I look mm -hmm. at healthy, healthy people. And, and see, what is the truth of that body? What have they been eating? How have they been conducting their lives? And it's usually very evident. Uh, you're a good example of, uh, of not only health, but uh, how you can take fitness uh, to, to the max. And, and if we really got into your diet, you, we'd see that there's whole foods and moderate, moderate uh, high in protein, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, free of a lot of processed junk in there. And, you know, and that's just the truth of it. And then when I need scientific validation, God bless Dr. Michael Greger, uh, mm. uh, I'll look up one of his videos and I go right to his reference section and, uh, and see exactly who he, who he referenced. And I, I click on those references and bring up those original studies. So I do a lot of backfield uh, research on, um, on, on these various topics. And um, I have to uh, pay homage to Dr. Barnard and Dr. Ornish, mm -hmm. who've uh, had the courage to lead the way. And uh, so uh, uh, those, are my, uh, uh, those are my human mentors. But uh, I think it was Dr. Roger Bacon long ago who said, Oh, physician, if, if you want to know the truth of health and healing, go walk in the green world and there you will find the truths you need to learn. And, uh, and I'm a big fan of walking in the forest and just listening and, 
and sitting by a creek and listening to my own body and, and watching healthy people and a lot of truth in there. <laughs> That's really cool. So with my audience and you know my channel, I get a lot of people that are sort of new to the vegan diet, new to a plant-based diet, and some people, you know, they sort of just dabble in it, uh, but they'll still have eggs for breakfast, or they will still have, uh, you know, they'll, uh, occasionally they'll still have a bit of meat here and there, or whatever. They just can't give up cheese or whatnot. Um, do you have any any sort of advice or encouragement, you know, to help push those people just that extra little bit, or or maybe even why they should or shouldn't? I don't know. Fair enough. So this, of course, is why you and I are doing this interview. It's the quandary that, that all of us in the plant-based world are facing as the ice caps are melting and we see the destruction that large-scale production of animal flesh is costing us. Uh, the plea is uh, we are being told on, on every level, individual health, um, the, the massive slaughter of animals and the destruction of the planet, the lights are flashing, adopt a plant-based diet. If you want to be healthy as individuals, if you want to survive as a species, it's time to adopt a plant-based diet. But as inherent in that question, how do you get people to do that? Mm -hmm. And because they love their cheese and they yeah. love their, <laughs> then, you know, I love my steak. So um, I'm a complete pragmatist. Man, whatever works, I'm all for it. And uh, if someone, uh, the reducitarians, if they can reduce their meat eating down to once a week, wonderful. That sure beats three times a day. I'll yeah. take that uh, at this point. Um, and enter these amazing new meat analogs, the Impossible <laughs> Burgers and all that stuff. And no one's saying they're the bastion of health. They are full of no. protein powder and, and oils. And so I know that. But, uh, but that nutritional deficit, I feel, is out, far outweighed by the benefit. One, on health, there's no cholesterol, and, and, and you don't have the new 5GC and the endotoxin and the antibiotics, and all the stuff inherent in meat in these plant-based burgers. But the fact that it came from plants, no animals were slaughtered, no rainforests were cut down, the, the, I'm all for these. If it helps Joe Macho Man get off his meat beef burger mm -hmm. onto these possible I am all for it and uh, they're transition foods no one's saying you should eat them three times yeah. a day this is a once a week treat just to just to uh, please his taste buds but so I'm a big fan of these transition foods I'm a big fan of reducing the meat whatever it takes to get people moving down that plant-based continuum yeah. I'm all for it and um, and so if I've got someone with a big health concern, with a high blood pressure, diabetes, you want to get rid of your diabetes, you want to get rid of your, your high blood pressure, whole food plant-based diet. But if, you got, if they've got kids, they've got grandkids, you, you want a live, livable world for them, then adopt a plant-based diet. Whatever, whatever port is open for them to hear, that's what I'll yell loudly through. And, uh, and hopefully, I mean, the ice caps are melting. We've run out of time at this point. We mm -hmm. must move to this plant-based evolution. So, uh, so I'm a big fan of whatever works. And uh, uh, as a physician, I play the health chord really loudly. But as someone who loves this planet, who loves the animals, um, I'll say for all those reasons, uh, eat plants and get on with it. Amazing. Cool. Well, I think that you know covers everything that I wanted to talk about today. I mean, we could talk for hours. But you are a wealth of knowledge and you have a lot of your knowledge online so people can definitely find tons of your videos and your talks and everything out there. I'll put links down below. You guys already know that. You can check out his YouTube channel and his website and everything. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me. You are a true pioneer of this uh, movement and of helping people get healthy and you're, you know, you're, um, the amount of people that you're helping is is so much greater than you even know because the butterfly effect is so strong and, and like I said I look to people like you and uh, you know Dr. Gregor and, and everybody for for my information that I continue to, to pass on uh, so yeah I just want to thank you for for being there for all of us and for being here today and, and um, talking with everybody and, and oh, as Derek, well. a great service that you've done for all your viewers and I want to thank you for helping get this word out between all of us we'll, yeah. uh, we'll help a better world going for all of us well, thank you, well, thank you. All right, that is it for the interview. Thank you all so much for checking it out and a huge thanks to Dr. Michael Clapper for sitting down with me and sharing his amazing knowledge with all of us. And a special thanks goes out to the person who set up this interview. I definitely appreciate it. It's a pretty amazing feeling to get to sit down with someone who you've looked up to for so long and uh, get to pick their brain like this. It was definitely pretty surreal for me. 
So definitely show Dr. Clapper some support and go subscribe to his YouTube channel. I know it would mean a lot to me and a lot to him if I saw that number jump up after these two videos that I'm uploading here. So thank you guys all so much. Definitely let me know what you thought in the comments down below and I'll see you guys soon with another video.